Sehr geehrter Herr Van Abel, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Gäste, ich darf Sie auch im Namen unseres bevollmächtigten Staatssekretär Volker Ratzmann herzlich begrüßen in der Vertretung des Landes Baden-Württemberg beim Bund, einem guten Ort zum Austausch von Gedanken und Erfahrungen und auch zum Ansprechen von Herausforderungen. Mein Name ist Andreas Schulze, ich bin der Leiter dieser Dienststelle und ich vertrete Herrn Ratzmann, der Sie heute gern begrüßt hätte. In unserem Haus finden in jedem Jahr um die 700 Veranstaltungen statt. 30.000 bis 40.000 Gäste besuchen uns dabei. Jede einzelne Veranstaltung ist uns wichtig. Aber unsere Sommerakademie sticht einerseits schon wegen ihrer Größe hervor, macht aber vor allem mit ihrem inhaltlichen Gewicht diesen Tag auch für uns zu einem besonderen. Ganz besonders freue ich mich, unsere Aussteller im Foyer begrüßen zu dürfen. Ich begrüße herzlich die Umwelttechnik Baden-Württemberg, die uns schon im vergangenen Jahr bei der Sommerakademie begleitet hat. Und ich möchte das ILEC begrüßen, das Institut für Leichtbau, Entwerfen und Konstruieren an der Universität Stuttgart. Seit der Stallwächterparty im Juli haben viele Besucherinnen und Besucher, hoffentlich auch Sie, den Rosenstein-Pavillon vor unserem Haus bewundert. Was genau es damit auf sich hat und was das mit unserem, mit unserem heutigen Thema zu tun hat, erklären Ihnen die Kolleginnen und Kollegen des ILEC sehr gern. Meine Damen und Herren, zum nunmehr sechsten Mal kommen wir hier in der Landesvertretung zur Sommerakademie zusammen und diskutieren Herausforderungen der Umwelt- und Klimapolitik. In den vergangenen Jahren ging es auf der Sommerakademie sehr stark um die Energiewende, ihre Globalisierung und Digitalisierung, um Energieeffizienz. In diesem Jahr widmen wir uns einem weiteren wichtigen Thema, und der Titel ist ja ganz eindeutig, Ressourcenwende. Ressourcenwende, Herausforderungen und Chancen für die Umwelt und Industrie haben wir die diesjährige Sommerakademie genannt. Vertreterinnen und Vertreter aus Politik, Wirtschaft und Verbänden diskutieren mit uns, mit Ihnen über die Herausforderung knapper werdender Rohstoffe. Wir wollen wissen, wie dieser nicht ganz neuen Herausforderung begegnet werden kann. Wir wollen wissen, welche Möglichkeiten der Zusammenarbeit zwischen Wirtschaft und Politik es gibt. Wo braucht es mehr Anstrengungen für tragfähige Lösungen? Es geht immerhin um sehr viel. Das Thema Ressourcenknappheit steht etwas im Schatten der Aufmerksamkeit zu Unrecht, wie wir meinen. Am 1. August haben wir den globalen Erdüberlastungstag, den Earth Overshoot Day, in diesem Jahr sogar noch einen Tag früher als im Jahr 2017. Seit dem 1. August leben wir also aus ökologischer Sicht über unsere Verhältnisse. Wir verbrauchen mehr Ressourcen, als die Erde im ganzen Jahr erneuern kann. Wer glaubt, dass das ein Problem der anderen ist, während wir ja hier in Deutschland ideell und technologisch auf besten Wegen sind, der irrt leider. Rechnen wir unseren Ressourcenverbrauch in Deutschland auf die gesamte Weltbevölkerung hoch, dann würde die Welt schon ab dem 2. Mai über ihre Verhältnisse leben. Das Thema Ressourceneffizienz drängt aber in diesem Jahr auch aus einem anderen Grund auf die Tagesordnung. Es gibt ein Jubiläum. Vor 50 Jahren gründete sich in Rom eine Organisation, die, mit nachhaltiger, die sich mit nachhaltiger Entwicklung und der Endlichkeit des Wachstums beschäftigte. Experten aus verschiedenen Ländern schlossen sich zum Club of Rome zusammen, um sich mit nicht weniger als den Problemen und Zukunftsfragen der Menschen und des Planeten auseinanderzusetzen. Ihre Fragestellungen waren existenziell. Wie muss Wachstum in der Zukunft aussehen? Was muss sich verändern in unserem Verhalten, in unserem Wirtschaftssystem? Und 50 Jahre später haben die vom Club of Rome aufgeworfenen Fragen nicht das Geringste an ihrer Bedeutung verloren. Sie stellen sich eher noch drängender. Ich freue mich deshalb sehr, dass wir heute die Gelegenheit haben, mit außerordentlich interessanten Fachleuten diesen Fragen nachzugehen. Beginnen werden wir mit der Keynote von Bas von Abel, Gründer und CEO von Fairphone. Fairphone und sein CEO wurden 2016 mit dem Deutschen Umweltpreis der Deutschen Bundesstiftung Umwelt ausgezeichnet und Fairphone darf das Umweltzeichen Blauer Engel tragen. Eine Erfolgsgeschichte. Aber Bas von Abel wird uns auch über die Schwierigkeiten und Konflikte berichten, die auftauchen, wenn man einen mittlerweile fast banalen Gebrauchsgegenstand wie ein Smartphone neu denkt und dabei den Ressourcenverbrauch und die soziale Nachhaltigkeit in den Blick nimmt. Im Anschluss daran diskutieren Politik, Wissenschaft und Wirtschaft auf unserer Bühne. Die Fragestellungen sind klar, welche Verantwortung haben Politik und Wirtschaftstreibende? Reichen die angestrebten Maßnahmen überhaupt aus, um eine Trendwende herbeizuführen? Und dann gibt es eine kurze Pause. Danach werden dann Professor Dr. Christian Berg, Mitglied des Präsidiums des Club of Rom Deutschland, und Bas van Abel, den Sie dann schon kennen werden, den feinen Unterschied von Theorie und Praxis erörtern. Und schließlich gehen wir dahin, wo es weh tut, und nehmen die Rolle der Bürger und Gesellschaft in den Blick, unsere eigene Rolle also. Wie beeinflussen wir mit unserem Verhalten den Ressourcenverbrauch? Sensibilisiert 
sind wir in der Regel dafür, dass wir die Ressourcen unserer Welt überstrapazieren. Aber es fehlt in vielen Bereichen des Alltags an der eigenen Bereitschaft. Es gibt eine Menge Themen am heutigen Tag zu besprechen. Ich hoffe sehr, dass es im Rahmen der diesjährigen Sommerakademie auf den Podien, aber auch am Rande der Veranstaltung gelingt, immer neue Zugänge zur Generationenaufgabe der Menschheit im 21. Jahrhundert zu finden. Nutzen Sie ruhig den Raum und die Zeit, Kontakte zu knüpfen, zu diskutieren, neue Ideen anzustoßen. Wir sind übrigens auch gespannt, wie Sie unser Online-Tool annehmen werden. Fühlen Sie sich wohl in der Landesvertretung von Baden-Württemberg. Unser Team wird alles dafür tun. Und ich darf den Platz jetzt freimachen für Frau Dr. Tanja Busse, Ihnen als Journalistin und Autorin bekannt, die uns mit Ihrer Moderation durch den Tag führen wird. Frau Busse, Ihre Bühne. Herr Schulze, vielen Dank. Ja, ich freue mich sehr, dass ich Sie heute durch den Tag und durch den Abend führen darf. Und zwar nicht nur alle, die hier im Saal sind, sondern auch Sie alle in den Weiten des Internets, die uns zuhören. Und ich freue mich sehr über das Thema, denn als Journalistin und Moderatorin, Autorin beschäftige ich mich seit Jahren mit den diversen Wänden, Agrarwende, Ernährungswende, Energiewende, Chemiewende, Ressourcenwende. Und je länger ich recherchiere, desto mehr merke ich, wie dringlich das alles ist. Und desto mehr finde ich auch, es ist so tragisch, dass auf vielen, vielen Veranstaltungen Leute kommen, die aus der Wirtschaft ganz tolle Lösungen haben. Und die sind Best Practice und bleiben Best Practice. Und diese tollen Sachen, die die machen, die werden nicht verbindlich und setzen sich nicht durch. Also draußen im Foyer ist ja das B10 ein Haus, das das Doppelte der Energie äh, produziert, die es verbraucht. Warum werden noch andere Häuser gebraucht? Wir sollen alle zum ILEC gehen, habe ich gerade gedacht. Also das Thema ist super wichtig. Und Baden-Württemberg hat es aufgegriffen. Das freut mich sehr, dass Baden-Württemberg gesagt hat, wir laden jetzt mal alle Beschleuniger der Ressourcenwende hierhin ein. Und wir beginnen mit einem Beschleuniger dieser Ressourcenwende. Das ist ein, Sie wissen schon, wer es ist, ein niederländischer Industriedesigner, der mal den Auftrag bekommen hat, für eine Stiftung zu recherchieren, wo kommen eigentlich all die Stoffe her, die wir an einem Smartphone verwenden und was passiert alles auf dem Weg mit den Menschen, die daran arbeiten. Und das Ergebnis dieser Studie hat ihm gezeigt, die Supply Chain für die Smartphones ist auch eine Supply Chain für Bürgerkriege. Und er hat beschlossen, das muss jetzt anders gehen. Das Ergebnis ist noch nicht ein perfektes, faires, gutes, weltverbesserndes Telefon. Aber es ist ein ganz wichtiger Schritt, zu zeigen, man kann auch komplizierte, lange Supply Chains auseinandernehmen. Blauer Engel und die vielen Preise hatte Herr Schulze schon alle erwähnt, mit denen es ausgezeigt ist. Bas von Abel ist heute nach Berlin gekommen, um uns zu zeigen, wie man was anfangen kann, aber auch wie kompliziert diese Sachen sind und wie wir trotzdem mit der Ressourcenwende vorankommen. Bas von Abel, the stage is yours. Thank you for coming to the um, yeah. okay. Do we have something for the slides? Where is the? Is it here? Ah, yeah. Okay. So, thanks for the great introduction. Sorry for still not <coughs> speaking German. Uh, I, I do happen to, to be a lot in Germany, and uh, uh, to be honest, for us, for Fairphone, Germany is a, is a super important country. Uh, on the first place that uh, you know, a lot of successes have been uh, acknowledged in Germany, but also that uh, the, the biggest Uh, market for Fairphone has been in Germany since the start. And biggest, I mean that with the first phone, actually more than half of our phones at that moment that we didn't even have a phone in the crowdfunding were bought by German customers. So um, there is quite a, a good relationship, I would say, between Germany and Fairphone. So maybe it's time for me to start uh, doing some German uh, classes next time. Um, so thanks for, uh, yeah, th thanks for inviting me. Uh, great to be on stage, and um, uh, yeah, I'm just going to go through what for me has been uh, uh, quite a journey to get here of, uh, of ups and downs, and uh, you might say uh, it has been, uh, <laughs> sometimes I, I, I explain to people that it feels sometimes like, uh, like a manic ride. Uh, the ups are really high, the downs are really low, but uh, it's, it's fantastic to be able to, uh, you know, to go, through this, go through this journey. But I wanted to start with a, with a bit of, uh, of, a, of a personal thing, uh, and, and maybe very high level. Um, I, I've been in India a while ago, and um, I bumped into uh, to a group of women like this uh, who had a mouth cap and a stick, a broom, in front of them. And I thought, like, wow, 
they are really afraid to get ill, right? <laughs> they are really afraid to actually get uh, bacteria or something. But uh, it was actually later that I found out that these are, uh, uh, it's a sub-religion of the Jain, Jain uh, culture in India. And um, the women actually have a mouth cap and a broom because they want to clean the, um, the, the space they walk on and have the mouth cap to not kill any living creatures. And um, I think that's quite exceptional. And to me, uh, while, while I was doing my work with Fairphone, I also, it also occurred to me that there is a tragedy. There's, a some, some, you know, there's some tragic element to it. Because even for them, it's not possible to live on this earth without having a footprint, without killing uh, other creatures. And I think that boils down for me to a basic thing I've been, you know, I've, 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 I've been taught when I started designing, and that is that by being here, we are creating and destroying at the same time. That means that if I, as a designer, make something and I use resources, I make something, I'm creating, I'm adding to, you know, adding value to, to the system, and I'm destroying at the same time. And that goes, you know, you can go, you can put that in uh, companies, you can put that in anything. But in essence, it's what life is about. Right? We're here on Earth, and we live, and by being here, we're part of a system, we're creating, we're adding, but we're also destroying. So I'd like to see sustainability also in that context. And that means that a lot of the things we will do, they are about dilemmas. And sustainability, to me, is being able, as a human being, and being open about facing those dilemmas instead of hiding them or just not you know, letting them be solved by a system. You know, I, I, I sometimes say uh, sustainability is a dirty business because, in a way, you have to do... You, you know, there's a lot of compromises that you will do during, uh, uh, you know, during the journey on sustainability. And a lot of things are not clear-cut, uh, black and white, and, and you know, to be honest, it's also not always a win-win situation. So let's, let's get down to, to, the, uh, down to earth a bit. Um, and let's look at phones, right? So I'd like to, uh, my background is design, like I said, and I love making products, but I also love to use those products to, to change systems. So I'm in it for the system change, and I see it as, uh, you know, you, as a designer, um, you know, you work with the matter, the stuff you see, uh, but I'm really into changing the dark matter, you know, the stuff you don't see. And without the dark matter, the stuff you see wouldn't be there. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's the real fun. But the good thing is that a product, something tangible, is always a very good starting point for people to get engaged with something. It's tangible. If I say to you guys, you know, Who's going to join me to create world peace? Hey. <laughs> you probably say, uh, you probably look like, ah, wait a minute, it's not going to happen. Probably too difficult, too big. Um, but, and that, that's what happened you know, seven years ago when we said we're going to make a phone. And you say, well, who's going to join us making a phone? You know, when we start from scratch from the mines, people are like, oh, that sounds like fun. I can relate to that. So, phones. Who's suffering here from nomophobia? 70% of the people are suffering from nomophobia, and it's actually the moment that you walk out of the door and you find out that you don't have your phone in your pocket, you go, and you feel those, you, you know those anxiety attacks, you have like, <gasps> and then either you, you rush back home, that's probably the 70% that suffer from nomophobia, or you say, well, what the heck, you know, I'll just get through the day. So it says something, and that's funny, it says something how close we are with our phones. And we are super close with our phones. There's actually a Vodafone study, and you know, that's, that, this was done in the UK, so don't worry about yourself too much. But this study was, was done in the UK, and it said that one out of three people, when they're having sex, they actually pick up the phone. One out of three. So there's a super, super intimate relationship, you might say, with your mobile phone. But the weird thing is, how much do we actually know our phone, how, how loyal <laughs> are we towards our phone? And I'd like to show you this, uh, this video where that uh, loyalty is uh, explained. 
It is kind of funny how people react when the new iPhone comes out. Some people actually get mad. Why would they make another product? I desperately want to buy those bastards. It's almost as if the new iPhone somehow ruins the old iPhone, but it doesn't. It's, it's all in your head. In fact, we set a camera out on the street today, and we told people outside to check out the new iPhone 5, which is unavailable so far. So in reality, they were, what they were looking at is the current iPhone 4S that everyone has. And well, here's how that experiment played out. The new iPhone 5 just came out today. We want to know if you'll take a look at it. Tell us how it compares to the last iPhone. I'd love to. Oh, it's way better. Yeah, it's nice. That's definitely noticeably better. It's a little, a little thinner. Looks like the screen's a little bigger. Seems a little bit faster. Yeah. Faster, lighter. Feels uh, heavier. Feels heavier? I think so. A lot lighter than the last one. It's a lot faster uh, as well. I think, I think we got the point, right? So, just to go back to the story, you, we, you know, how, how much, what, what it shows is that, you know, it's a very simple, oh, let me forward this a bit, it's a very simple thing, and that is that it poses the question, do we really need the products we buy? And you know, if you don't even see the difference between the previous products, or we think the, you know, the new product is actually you know, the previous product, um, and this has nothing to do with, you know, with Apple or iPhones, it could be any phone, but marketing has been really good at selling stuff we don't actually need. So marketing works, storytelling works, that's the good news. The other thing is how do we use that in a way that we actually promote a different thing, and that is consume less stuff, because it's really easy. We're talking here about resource efficiency and all that, all that stuff. But it's clearly, very clearly and very simple that if we use a product twice as long, we only need to produce half the amount of products. It's a very simple calculation because if you look at, at, at products in itself, and let's look at a phone, a phone, the footprint of a phone is in production. By the moment you have it in your hand, the harm is already done. That means that if you only produce half the amount of phones, you will win a lot. The use of the phone is actually, you know, the energy consumption of a phone throughout a year is as much as driving a car for two hours. Yes, so, so just keeping that phone is the solution. And then you can be, you know, to, to resource efficiency. And also looking at it, it creates only half the amount of waste. So, you know, it's a civil calculation as well. If you produce half the amount of products, you create half the amount of electronic waste. And a lot of this waste ends up in, in dumps like this in Ghana. And a lot of these dumps, there's phones there with batteries in them because we want to have thin phones with batteries glued to the inside so that, that they can make them thinner. And they cannot be replaced there. I'm not sure, is there anyone who has replaced their battery in the phone ever? Well, that's quite a few people already. Oh, you have a fair phone. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's uh, you know it's it's not something that uh, that happens uh, 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 often. And and you know what happens? And you have that with screens. You have that with uh, uh, with the batteries. But you know that the subscription uh, for, you know with the European legislation, you can only have a subscription for one or two years with your operator. Then after two years, what happens? They offer you a new phone. You've been walking around with that phone with that crack on the screen for a while already, and you think, yeah, what the heck? I'll take the new phone because then I you know I don't have to wait. Bring back the phone, get a new screen. Same goes for batteries. Batteries worn, you know, they go down after two years. So you want to have a new battery, or you just take a new phone. So if you want to have a phone longer, you, you need to make it easy for people to actually replace the parts. So that's what we did with Fairphone. We made it so easy, we took away the thresholds of replacing parts. So for example, the, well, the battery, like we just said, is very important. But also, if you, um, uh, one of the things that break a lot is the, is the screen. So just taking away the threshold for people to replace the screen you make it uh, consumer repairable so that you can actually change the screen at home by just ordering one online. And what we hope to do with that is that people use our product longer. That's the single most important thing we want to get at. The only problem is that 
you also need people that want to use that product longer. <laughs> because you, you can make products longer, but still you need to have people that you know, act upon that. So what we, um, what we also do is, is looking at how can we create that phone that tastes better than the other phones because there is a story behind it. And you know, you do that by, with, with organic food. You do that with uh, uh, maybe even with banking or with energy because you have a relation with it. Technology is dehumanized in, in every aspect. We've, we've hidden all the, the, the human aspects of technology. So what we try to do is to bring that back. And we do that by, by saying, you know, if you can't open something, you can't own it. If you don't have ownership, you can't take responsibility. And that's why it's so important, not only for people to be able to repair their stuff, but also to open it and show it and tell stories around it. So we, we, we use these products to create connections because we believe that creating a connection with a product is the single most important thing you can do for people to feel more responsibility over their product. And it is about alienation in the end with the products we use. So with Fairphone, we, we try to show the whole uh, um, a story behind making a phone. And, uh, and that's how, we've, how we started in 2013. And I'd like to show you the first movie we made to get people actually to buy the Fairphone. So this is way back in 2013. And this is really aimed at uh, uh, getting people excited about a product which they, they don't know anything about. Stuff. More stuff. All this stuff. You name it, we have it. But what we don't have, a clue about what's inside this stuff. We don't know where it comes from or who made it. We know almost nothing about our stuff. That's why we started with an alternative for the thing we can't live without. Our phone. We are the people of Fairphone. Hey. Hello. Hello. Good day. Hi. Guten Tag. And this, this is what we're building. The Fairphone. As smart as other phones, but fair. Which makes it more than a phone. It's a beginning, a step in the right direction. We're making it happen. A smartphone that's made in a way that puts people and the environment first. We're already working hard on the first batch. We're almost there. And that's where you come in. To start making them, we need you to pre-order. Because by buying and owning this phone, you can make a difference. You become part of change. Buy a phone. Start a movement at fairphone.com. So this is actually how we, how we got people excited about buying a phone that didn't exist from a company that didn't exist and uh, never made a phone before. And it worked because 25,000 people bought a phone and that showed to us that there's a real, uh, uh, there is a demand for these products and people do care about these products. So we started in, uh, in Congo with, this, you know, with, uh, with the mine and our, the idea that we had was to really use the phone as a starting point for discussion and debate around what is truly fair because we knew at that point that of course we wouldn't be able to make a 100% fair phone. Because in a phone, just the complexity, it's, you know, it's, it's really not a banana. 1,200 components do we have on the bill of material. And these 1,200 components are made by factories all around the world, and people working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And these 1,200 components, they are made with minerals from all over the world. More than 60 minerals go into a phone. And these are mined also all over the world in mines like this. And these are guys, this is one of the mines that we work with. And we're really proud of working with these guys. But we are working with these guys in a mine in Congo, and we know that there's still, still child labor in those mines. And we are making a fair phone. So one of the steps that you have to, you know, you have to understand when you start going to work from inside the system is that you're also going to be dictated by the rules of the system you're trying to change. And you have to be able to take it step by step. And we could have gone to Australia and say, like, guys, listen, let's go to Australia and all working conditions are fine. And 
would that be a more fair phone than actually going to Congo, making sure that the economic system there keeps alive and make sure that not all companies that want to risk avoid the situation leave Congo and that there's no livelihood at all? Yeah, so these are the things that you're dealing with. But you can make change there. We have conflict-free minerals tracked and traced all the way from the mines and people are making a living instead of joining the rebels and making war. We work with, uh, uh, in China with programs on, um, uh, on, on worker representation. So we work with a, uh, we call it the Worker Welfare Fund in the factory, and these are representatives. And what we do is we put a premium in a, in a fund where these workers, together with us and the management, can choose what the money is going to be spent on. So all the bonuses from Fairphone are not spent only on the people working on the phone, but for the whole factory. And we, you know, we're testing here how you can work with democratic elections, how you can work with uh, worker representations in the factory. And a lot, a lot of these things, you know, they, they don't work, but some of them actually work out really well. And we have programs also in Ghana where we take back phones, and we actually took back more phones than we have put into the market. And this really catalyzes a lot also in Ghana where local entrepreneurs are able to uh, build up a living around making, uh, yeah, about collecting phones. And these phones are collected and they're being brought back to, uh, to our Europe to be uh, disassembled and for all the minerals to be used and being put back into the supply chain again. But this, you know, there's a lot of dilemmas here in here, <laughs> um, and I can go, I can do a whole list, but uh, you know, we don't have time for, for you know, going through all the dilemmas. Um, but what I, what I really want to stress is that it's really a starting point to try to solve the bigger issues. If you want to create that systemic change, and that's what we've done, you can run a business, you can be part of that system, and you can take it step by step, you, but you will be in situations where you have to ask yourself, oh, am I going to bribe that guy? <laughs> it seriously happened. Or am I going to accept the fact that you know, it stops here? What are the compromises that you can make? If you ask me plainly, Buzz, are you, uh, you know, if you, if you would have child labor in the supply chain, you would not do it, right? That's a really no-go area. Now, I'm standing here and I can tell you, I, 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 I don't know. I really don't know, because you know, sometimes you have to work from the ground. So, it's just the beginning, but we've proven by being part of that system that you can take steps and that if you surface something, that you can create a, a platform, a safe space for many other companies, many other organizations to actually be part of change instead of hiding the truth. So what we're doing is balancing the desire for a better world with the realities of running a business. And I know, you know I, and people in here who run a business know what I'm talking about if you say, well, it's difficult to balance these things. But that's also the fun of it. I think if you're into, into sustainability, you don't like dilemmas, well, it's going to be very tough. <laughs> so, this is what I like about it. Buy a phone, join a movement. That's one part. We have key performance indicators in our company, and it says the more phones we sell, the better we do. Why? Because we want to show that there's a demand for ethical electronics. But <laughs> we also have a key performance indicator in the company that we want people to use their phone as long as possible. And that's when it really becomes fun for salespeople, because salespeople, <laughs> they can only sell phones to people that, don't, that, that, that actually do need the phone. And that is a challenge, and I like these challenges, because this is at the core of doing sustainable business, that you accept the fact that these challenges are there. And you know, let's not call them compromises. Let's, let's call them you know, being human instead of you know, always talking about it has to be win-win from an economical point of view, because this is what it's really about. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bas. You can stay with me. You can stay here for three or oh, two yeah, questions, sure. maybe, because um, well, time timetable is working today. Um, in the back there is Anna with the microphone, and take the chance to 
ask about the balance, about a smartphone not being a banana. You can ask in German, in English, whatever you like, even in Dutch, maybe. So are there any questions or ideas or suggestions? Wow, I thought I had a problem with silencing people. Just another thought? Some secrets? <laughs> also, gerne auch auf Deutsch. Da hinten ist eine Frage. Okay, hello, my name is Katie. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for your talk. I have one question. Who is mainly buying your phone? I mean, you were mentioning that a lot of Germans are buying, obviously, your phone. Yeah. But also US citizens or Indian citizens. Do you have any numbers from Central Asia, Asia, China? Maybe you can give us an insight on that. Yeah, Thank we, you. we only sell in Europe. So thanks for the question. We, we only sell in Europe. So we have uh, uh, numbers on, on, on Europe. Um, that has several reasons. Operationally, we don't ship and distribute. You know, it's too difficult. Uh, we know the European market better, and we, you know, it's it's easier for us to, to focus on that. And uh, some of the products don't work optimal because of the, the frequencies and the bands of the phones in the US and other countries. Um, so in Europe, we have uh, Germany is definitely number one, and then Switzerland has the highest uh, Fairphone penetration. Um, Austria. Uh, France, quite big, uh, England, UK, and Netherlands, Belgium. And I think if you, if you look at it, it's a lot of, a lot of uh, the, the rich countries in that sense. So uh, you know, I, 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 I do think that there is a uh, connection between uh, the, you know, the welfare of a country and the willingness to, buy, to, to do a risk buy, I would say. Because you know, if a, co a company that only is, is, is here for five years uh, and of obviously has to learn a lot still, and uh, improving the quali you know, quality of the product, improving the, quali the product itself, um, is, is something that, uh, that, yeah, that ta is taken into the consideration when uh, people buy a product. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, are distribution or sales channels working to the benefit of your Fairphone business model? Um, yeah, it's a good question. That is, uh, yes, but the question is how far are they willing to go? You know, you see, what, what we see is that a lot of the distribution channels, uh, they, they are reluctant because the, the profits on the phone are, you know, are, you have to have high volumes to make like, really good profits on the phone as a distributor. Um, so that's, that's holding them back into putting real marketing spend on it. But they love to have Fairphone in the portfolio. <laughs> and I, I think you can draw the conclusion from that, right? Not a Frage. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the, um, the history or the, the fast development of Fairphone is really impressive. And I have a question. Do you know if it had already any impacts on other mobile phone com companies that they changed their um, uh, sourcing or their pro uh, yeah. processing? Yeah, but at this, at, uh, with some we actually work together. So one is, uh, you know, we, 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 we work also with uh, Philips, Tata Steel, uh, with other companies like, who, who are joining us on certain minerals. Um, with behind the scenes, we're doing a lot with uh, companies like Apple, and uh, you know, we, we're in discussion on setting up projects and exchanging a lot of information. And indirectly, uh, to give an example, we're the first ones that have Fairtrade Gold implemented in the supply chain, certified all the way to the factory. Uh, it's, a, it's an Austrian factory and uh, runs its business in, uh, in Shanghai. And they also uh, make uh, printed circuit boards for other phone manufacturers. So there's actually, and, and now they use Fairtrade Gold in the factory. And there's actually quite a lot of uh, phone manufacturers uh, of well-known brands that, uh, that uh, have Fairtrade Gold in their phone without even knowing it, because we do it. <laughs> But of course, the question is also about balancing. Do you fear to lose your unique selling point if all the well, if the air impact becomes too big? Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's yeah. It's a, uh, you know, there's there's an you, you're you're not going to patent fairness, right? <laughs> it's, it's not like oh, let's uh, let's make sure that nobody else can do it because then we. So it, the whole idea is that 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 you actually make sure that that you scale up programs that others are following you. It's actually in our mission. Our mission is you know, create a, uh, a more sustainable, more ethical uh, electronic supply chain and create followers. So that is indeed the balancing act. 
But having said that, there is, you know, I've, I've, we actually, I think that is the, the beautiful part of what we're doing, that we see, we've, 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 we, are, we are really creating a safe space also for companies to, to experiment with more sustainable uh, business models, plans, and behavior. Uh, because we show more transparency, because we show that, there is, you know, that things are not black and white, and consumers are, you know, exp they're, 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 I think they are more forgiving towards Fairphone in terms of what we say about uh, what we're doing and what is not done yet than to the big brands. And they are benefiting from it as well. So it gives them kind of a space to start operating in a different ways. So for them, it's good. For us, it's really about, you know, we have to stay true to what we promise. And as long as we do that, pioneering on, on the ethical, uh, so the social and the environmental uh, elements, uh, we, are, you know, we are competitive on that. And we have to be number one. That's, you know, and that's, that's pure competition that you're dealing with as well. The microphone is coming to you. <laughs> Thanks. Just the uh, last one. Is it by intent that you're not using the word cradle to cradle to describe no. parts of what you're doing? You know about the Michael, uh, Michel Baumgart concept of cradle to cradle? Yeah, yeah, we, we, uh, we are close contact with him. He visited the, uh, so uh, uh, um, McDonough, so Bill, is Bill I, 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 know, I, I actually talk to Bill quite a lot. <laughs> so, uh, and he comes to the office once in a while, and uh, we do, uh, we, we, we are working on also using cradle to cradle materials in the phone. But I think cradle to cradle is a very, uh, has become a very technical way of looking at how to uh, tackle problems around sustainability. Um, it's been very, uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, don't, I don't necessarily are against cradle to cradle. I think it's just a, a word or a, you know, it's, it's a different way of saying what we're also trying to do. But what I, what I do believe, and I think that's where the big difference is between how we operate and how cradle to cradle really starts. We operate, we started from the social elements, really on, on the, the working conditions and, and the ethical aspects. We've incorporated sustainability in it, but more from a behavioral aspect with the consumer than the actual use of detoxing and those kind of things. Our next steps will be on the detoxing and the resource efficiency of the materials itself. But our biggest influence that we have is on the actual longevity related to how long the consumer is willing to use that product. And you know, we've done a study with Fraunhofer and they uh, calculated that uh, over a three years use with the current architecture of the, of the Fairphone, the footprint is 30% less than with a, you know, with a normal phone where you have to uh, uh, do the, the repairs in a different way. So it makes sense that we do that because that's our span of control. Vielen Dank, Bas von Abel. Ich bin mir nicht sicher, wie weit das jetzt wie so ein Insidergespräch sich angehört hat oder wenn ich zwei Sätze zu Cradle to Cradle sage, dass sie dann alle sagen, mein Gott, kennen wir alle schon. Also die Idee vom deutschen Chemiker und Greenpeace-Mitarbeiter äh, Michael Braungart, keinen Müll mehr zu produzieren, sondern alle Bausteine so, wie es eben in diesem Handy passiert, wieder zu verwenden, das alles dass kein Müll mehr entsteht, sondern alles in einem richtigen Kreislauf der Verwendung wiederverwendet wird. Und dass es nur organische und nicht organische Bausteine gibt, aber niemals so etwas wie Müll. Das ist die Idee dahinter. Und, genau. und die Idee wird uns, dann, glaube ich, noch ein bisschen weiter verfolgen, auch die Frage, wie modular so. man etwas bauen kann. Wenn jetzt niemand mehr mit den Fingern schnipst und ein Mikrofon herbeizitiert, würden wir, glaube ich, weitermachen. Mhm. Erstmal, da ist doch noch eine Frage. Es muss ganz schnell gehen, sonst ja. verlieren wir unseren Zeitplan und Sie kommen nicht zum Abendempfang. Bitte. Sorry, it's me again. It's very Very easy question. Did Google, Samsung or Apple try to buy your company or your Fairphone in any case? Have you had any time and offer on the table? Uh, very, very short answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Wir nehmen Sie beim Wort. Herzlichen Dank, Bas von Abel. <laughs>